Good evening all. I'd like you to welcome you to the Timber Development UK's um, University Design Challenge. My name's Tabitha Binding, and if I can get my screen to move forward, we will get started. We have a huge challenge. Retrofit is essential. essential. It's not easy, it's far more challenging than new build, and it takes a team of knowledgeable, caring professionals to accomplish schemes that work. So we need our future professionals to understand the complexity and embrace the constraints and the challenges. Timber Development UK, in partnership with the AEC, BEST, NMITE, Edinburgh Napier University and the Passive House Trust, along with software support from Trimble, the Passive House Institute and the AECB bring you this challenge. It's an interdisciplinary university team challenge to design, engineer and cost a retrofit scheme for an existing timber frame building that requires a second life. It's the old cricket pavilion in Hereford. There are two standards that you can retrofit to, the NFIT standard and the AECB standard. And tonight we're going to find out all about the NFIT standard from professionals who are at the forefront of that work. We have Sarah Lewis from the Passive House Trust, Rachel Mitchell from Greenbox Associates and Chris Morgan from John Gilbert Architects Limited. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and hand over to you, Sarah. That's great. Thank you very much, Tab. Let me just get my screen shared. And someone can shout if that is not sharing the right screen. Am I sharing the right screen? Good. It's always good when the technology works. Okay, great. So as Tab said, um, my name is Sarah Lewis. I am from the Passive House Trust, where I work as the Research and Policy Director. So the Passive House Trust provides an independent kind of non-profit organization that provides leadership in the UK for the adoption of the standard and methodology. And our aim is very much to promote the principles of Passive House as a highly effective way of reducing energy use and carbon emissions from buildings in the UK, as well as providing really high standards of comfort and building health and really um, important and increasingly important, of course, in our warming climate is summer comfort and Passive House buildings provide that as well. At the Passive House Trust, we have lots of useful resources for those interested in Passive House Retrofit. Um, we have a detailed position paper and also a pretty handy kind of four page primer. So that's if you just want to kind of get a starting point for having a look at Passive House Retrofit. And if you're looking for a bit of inspiration for your project, we do have a gallery of case study projects, which you can kind of click on to find out more about how different different practices, different architecture practices, approach the retrofit of different buildings around the UK. And you can find all of that on the Passive House Trust retrofit page. And I put the short link on the page there and I'll, I don't know if we have a chat function today, um, but I'll, I'll pop it, um, tab can circulate it to you uh, if, if you would like access to that. Um, and I think since, do we, do we have a chat? Was that established? I don't think we do. If there's not a chat function and you do have questions, you can save those up and ask them live at the end of the, the presentations today. Okay, so in this session, I'm just going to start by giving some very brief info about the kind of retrofit in the UK, the kind of wide context stuff. Then I'm going to talk about kind of what does Enerfit deliver as a standard? I'm going to talk about the different approaches to Enerfit just broadly. Rachel will go into more detail about the specific building you're looking at in the competition. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the Enerfit informed retrofit plan, which is just a way of using Enerfit to help you deliver uh, low energy um, design, retrofit design in buildings. So this is a graph which you might have seen before. It comes up quite a lot in presentations. We use it a lot at the Trust. And it's really good because it's it's the um, effectively it's showing us what the IPCC identified as the CO2 pathway that we need to follow to get to net zero. So that's the red line on the graph here. And the green line is the line we took to get to where we are today. So that, and that's in terms of like worldwide CO2 emissions. So as you can see, the red line is a lot steeper. So we very much need to act now. And just to be clear, for our sector, so for buildings to meet their part of the reduction, we're not talking about a kind of slow, gentle, incremental improvement over many years, decades. We, we're not talking about just setting targets. We need to be pretty real and agree that this needs urgent and dramatic action and it needs to happen not in 2050, not in 2030. Um, not even in 2025, but it needs to happen today, which is why it's so great that as students, you're learning and you're gaining the tools 
that you need to be able to deliver these low energy buildings for the future. So with that last graph in mind, with that super steep line, how are we doing in the building sector? Well, this is how we're getting on. This is how us professionals have managed to get on. Um, hopefully, as you all graduate, you will be able to improve the trajectory of this line because you can see this is pretty much a flat line in terms of the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from our sector uh, over the last decade. And buildings are responsible for a lot of the overall UK CO2 emissions, so about 23% uh, of emissions. And it's important to also think that buildings generally are pretty wasteful and inefficient. So they are an area where we could make really significant, dramatic improvements if we choose to do so. And the UK has some of the oldest and least energy efficient um, stock in the whole of Europe. And 80% of the buildings that are going to be around in 2045 or 2050 um, have already been built. So it's really important um, that we focus on making those really deep energy improvements in our existing building stock. I'm just thinking to myself here that I've not put in a, uh, I've not put a timer on, but I will try to just rattle through. I just don't want to take up too much time from from Rachel and um, Chris talks. Okay, but the the big takeaway here is it's a big chunk of what's going to be around in the future. We've already got, so we've got to retrofit these buildings. So the kind of adaptive reuse when you're a student looking at, at projects, that's really where you should be focusing your attention rather than learning how to build and design new buildings. We should really be focusing on retrofit. So the Pacifies Enerfit standard, which is the retrofit standard, has the same five guiding principles as the Pacifies New Build standard. So in a way, it's no different because it's a fabric based standard. So it needs you to have a continuous thermal envelope. It needs you to optimize your solar gain, obviously working within the constraints of where the existing um, orientation of the building and the windows uh, are at the moment. You've got to try to get it thermal bridge free. So Chris, I think will probably um, be able to shed some light on how tricky that is in an existing building, but it's, it, we're always aiming towards that. There will obviously be some residual thermal bridges. We're trying to make it draft free. So we want it to be a really comfortable draft free building. So we need to have a kind of air tightness strategy for the building. And because of that, we're gonna be providing our fresh air through a mechanical system called a um, MVHR system. So mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. So all the buildings will have that. So all of our kind of in-depth research at the trust suggests that achieving net zero, making sure that um, we can use fossil fuel um, heating for our buildings, so enabling things like heat pumps, improving health, and also realizing kind of broader societal benefits are most likely to be achieved with a really deep level of retrofit, which results in significant energy reduction. Shallow retrofit, so just doing little odd jobs to buildings, puts building owners at risk of possessing stranded assets. And as a result, they've kind of locked in these poor carbon decisions for many decades into the future. And there's also this risk that shallow measures are not kind of part of a whole building plan, which can result in unintended consequences. So we want to avoid that. So that's things like not thinking maybe about the moisture consequences of what we're doing, or not thinking about the ventilation and how we're going to keep that um, at a good level in a building. Okay, so this is now I mean talking about what Enerfit itself can deliver. So space heating demand is a kind of key criteria for passive house, and it's a pretty good proxy for building fabric performance. So at the trust, they worked with Letty to work up a kind of U a UK stock model of the existing. This is looking at domestic buildings, but it sort of typical of the existing building stock, um, and it's showing uh, the different types of houses. Cut, um, broken down by the different typologies so flats, terraces, detached houses or bungalows. But what I wanted to point out was that the um, the average, the kind of mean space heating demand of the current stock is that, or, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's around the kind of 120, 130 kilowatt hours. So that's the space heating demand. A typical new build is over here about 80. And then when you come over to this cluster of standards over here, this is the kind of passive house um, new build standard, the, the very highest end, and it goes through the benefit approaches and the AECB standards. So they're kind of clustered together as our kind of best, best practice approaches. And that's why they're the standards being looked at um, for this competition. 
I'm not going to expect you to read all of this slide. If you, it's too small on your screen, that's not a problem. I'm going to talk through the key things. This is just a kind of comparison of the two standards you're looking at and also get the guidance that has been produced around uh, retrofit by Letty, which again, I do recommend you have a look at. I'll, I'll show you a link to that document um, at the end of the session. So in terms of the kind of numbers, the Enerfit standard has two different ways of uh, achieving it. And we're looking at this, the heating demand of buildings as, as that kind of proxy for performance, fabric performance. So you can see there Enerfit on the left, the heat demand method is at 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. So that's our kind of highest standard of performance. And then the AACB standard next to it sits at about 50 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. Now, the Enerfit does have an alternative means of uh, certification, which is not so tied to that space heating demand. It's kind of a component based approach, which I'll describe in a moment. And it has a bigger range of uh, space heat demand results, usually in the range of sort of 20 to 60 kilowatt hours. So you can see that we're, we're always talking about, you know, less than half of the existing average for the existing housing stock. So we're talking about dramatic improvements. And then both the Enerfit and the AACB uh, standards use the PHPP. So that's a tool you're going to be getting access to and you'll get some training in how to use that. So they both use the PHPP. It's a, it's a tool that was developed by the Passive House Institute. So it's a Passive House tool, but the AACB has adopted it as a good methodology um, for calculating low energy buildings. Now I'm not gonna talk too much about Letty. And then I just wanted to point out it's a worldwide standard, so you can have Enerfit buildings anywhere. And we are over here, obviously, in the UK, which puts us in the, um, the cool temperate zone. So most of our projects will be aiming for a space heat demand on the component on this uh, component approach at that 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum. So there is also an alternative means of compliance, which is the component approach. So it looks a bit more complicated on this slide, but it's not too complicated. But and it, so instead of referring to like individual component parts that make up a building, it's kind of referring to overall um, constituent parts, really like walls, floors, roofs. And it's giving you basically U values that you need to meet. It's giving you U values for windows and doors um, and specifications that you need to meet for things like windows. So it gives you lots of information. And if you comply with all of that, you can get the certification without aiming for the 25. And we'll go into a bit more detail as I talk through a couple of sort of example projects on why you might choose one method over the other. And Rachel's obviously um, also going to go into that when she talks about the specific building. She'll be speaking after myself. Um, but generally, the component method is a good option if you've got a building which maybe has a poor orientation or the form of the building is very inefficient or maybe the existing glazing is just not good for getting solar gain. So the building itself might just be designed in a way that's not very conducive to getting a really good heat demand. So it's just an option that's there with Passive House because the Passive House Enerfit standard, the retrofit standard, is quite flexible in that way. And then for various reasons, you might not be delivering an Enerfit project all at once. You might be delivering it over many years, maybe a couple of decades. And the Enerfit also has an approach that you can do that as a step-by-step -step project. Now, you're not doing that for this competition, so I'm going to skip over this side. But it's just to let you know that, that is an option that's there uh, for other projects, something you can tell people people about it. and the reason we like it is because it means that this graph is showing that you know in 2021 you design the full retrofit and the light blue is the deep retrofit so that each time you're doing something to the building you're doing it to the best level you can at the time rather than doing the shallow measures which are shown in the dark sort of greeny blue color and you can see that by designing in that performance at each step you're able to have an end result which could be compliant with net zero if that was your plan or compliant with Enerfit rather than locking in that poor performance so you don't want to be re-retrofitting a building um, that you've retrofitted uh, in 20 to 22 doing it again before 2045 or 2050. And certainly a mix of these approaches is going to be required when we need to look at kind of wide scale um, estates, so like local authorities trying to address their estates. And there's a, a good report that's out uh, that was produced by a company called Archetype on uh, any statewide plan they did for Edinburgh City Council. And there's a blog, and I think I put a link yeah, on that site so you can have a look at that if it's of interest. Okay, so the following three projects are all ones I worked on over the years, and this is, um, they're all uh, the heat demand method, so aiming for benefit through the heat demand method. 
And this one's from back in 2011, and it kind of is just to show that deep energy retrofits aiming for Enerfit are not new. Um, but for some reason, it's taken the UK a while to kind of pick up speed with this kind of retrofit challenge. And I think now we're seeing a lot more projects aiming for that standard or other really low energy standards, which is great. Hopefully you can all spot the benefit uh, on this slide. And this was another project from around the same time uh, that I was working on when I was in London. And again, we did post occupancy evaluation of this building. It was an old tram generation building and it is uh, now it's operated as a community centre. So not so far away from the project you guys are looking at. Uh, and post-occupancy evaluation showed that there was an 85% total energy reduction. So not just on space heating, but total energy reduction on that project. And I just find it very interesting because the total project, 85% reduction, but it was only 7% more expensive to go all the way to Enerfit to the very best we could, rather than just upgrading to building regulations. Because actually going to around the building and doing work to each element is expensive, like replacing a window with a rubbish double glazed window would have been expensive. So we replaced it with a super high energy efficient triple glazed window. That upgrade wasn't the big bit of the expense. The expense was getting the scaffold and the, the guys on site and taking out the old windows and all the work that's around it. So when you're in there doing it, do it to the very best standard you can. Okay, and then this is a school project, uh, which is sort of in Scotland and it's at stage four. Tab, am I running out of time? Is that why you've just come up? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, let me just, okay. This is the, a couple more projects, heat demand method ones, a few more there. The bottom one's one of Chrissy's ones. And this is the component approach. So I just want to mention this one um, before I round off the presentation, just because this is kind of important because I think this is one of the approaches you might want to look at. So as I said, it doesn't refer to um, like certified passive house components, but rather the kind of component parts that make up a building. So your walls, your floors, your roof, your windows and doors. So rather than set that specific space heating demand target, this alternative approach allows um, you to set limits for the thermal performance of the building elements alongside the same targets for air tightness, ventilation and surface temperatures. So you get the comfort and health part of the standard, but it's more flexible in terms of what um, the kind of uh, approach to the, the individual elements. And as I said, you're gonna be using PHPP, you're gonna get, Aptab's gonna get you access to that software. So you'll be introduced to that. And I think Rachel will be helping you out with some, some uh, training, maybe myself. We'll see how that works out in the new year. So looking forward to that. Um, I'm not going to go into this one, but this is in the Path of House Trust retrofit position paper. So do have a look at this. But this is just sort of highlighting that we start off by sort of investigating the building. Then we need to make our plan. If you can go for the heat demand method, that's great. You might want to consider phasing it and doing the step by step. Obviously not for this project. You'll be doing it as a single step because it's a design project. But that's to get your benefit badge. And the component approach is the other way to get that badge. And if you can't make those standards, then we do recommend you look at other things like the AACB standards. So some of you might pick that for, for this project. Um, so this is the final bit tab. So a pacifies benefit is an exemplar approach to achieving that kind of net zero in our existing buildings. And it meets the predicted capacity of our future decarbonized grid. So really good one to look at. And I'm just gonna leave you with those resources. And while the others are speaking, I'll put these in an email to you tab if we don't have the chat function and you can send that out. So on that note, I'm gonna hand over to Rachel who's gonna talk a little bit about some analysis she's done on the competition building. Thank you, Sarah. And while uh, Rachel gets her presentation up, we do not have the question and answer function or the chat. For some reason, I can't get it working. So it gives us all a little bit of extra time, which I'm sure you'll be pleased about. But uh, over to you, Rachel. Uh, Rachel, you're on mute. Okay, I've hopefully shared my screen though. Is that working okay? Excellent. So one out of two isn't too bad. Thank you. So my name is Rachel Mitchell. Um, I have a, a consultancy called Greenbox Associates and I'm a passive house designer and I've worked on um, new build projects and retrofit projects. I'm also a retrofit coordinator and I've worked on some of the social housing um, retrofit schemes as well. Um, so what I wanted to do this evening is just to have a little look at the building um, talk a bit about the constraints um, and the approach really to retrofit. Um, I'm going to talk a very little bit about PHPP because we don't really have a chance to um, go through that in detail. 
and then look at the just look at the two approaches using the space heating demand method and the component method and just maybe some of the kind of just some of the differences and some of the things to think about based on this building and based on you know just using this so um just in terms of introducing the building we've got a, we've got a community building made out of timber and Chris is going to talk to you a lot more about the challenges of retrofitting in timber, so I'm not going to go in that now. Um, I understand, and tab, tab, correct me if I'm right, we have got some constraints on the building in terms of keeping the front facade. Yes, so we've got to keep the front facade, so that, that creates some things to think about. Um, and I think one of the main, main issues of this building is it's a small building. And um, form factor is really important when you're designing low energy buildings. And what I mean by form factor is the relationship between your external heat loss surfaces. So your walls, your floors, your roofs, your windows and your internal floor area, because you are looking to meet a standard that's um, a space heating demand per meter squared. So that's not quite internal floor, it's treated floor area, but roughly internal floor area. So the more internal floor area, and the, and the less external heat loss surface areas you've got, the easier it is to meet your standard. So the first problem you have with this building is it's quite constrained because it's got poor form factor. And I'll, I'll talk to that about that a little bit more as we go through. So one of the options you've got in this design, this design competition is to put an extension on. And I would suggest very strongly that you use that extension to improve the form factor of the building, because that's gonna help you overall with the design and make things a lot easier for you. Okay, so um, hopefully we moved on to the next slide, that's right. Um, so we're gonna use, um, sorry, this is a very old version of PHPP. This uh, shows how long I've been teaching it. So we are going to use um, PHPP for this design and you can also use it for the ACB option. So it's a really useful tool to learn. And actually when you go out there and get into practice as well, being able to use PHPP and to be a passive house designer is a really good asset to have and a really very, a skill that's very much in demand at the moment. Um, and as Sarah said, we will provide some more training um, uh, on PHPP in January. But I thought I'd just um, give you a very, very brief introduction. So <clears throat> PHPP is a series of very clever and interconnected spreadsheets, um, which allows you to um, very effectively model the, um, the energy demand um, and the overheating risk and the overall uh, so that uh, and the overall energy demand of your building and it's kind of split into three three sections um, which is very helpfully color coded so the, the, the kind of yellow section of PHPP looks at heat loss so we're looking at um, you know we're looking at areas we're looking at u values we're looking at windows and we're looking at um, ventilation and ventilation losses. And we've already talked about these are very airtight buildings, so we're trying to minimize our ventilation losses. And then the kind of blue section of it looks at overheating and overheating risk. And that's really important to consider um, when you're designing low energy buildings, because um, we need to make sure that we're, whilst we're improving the energy efficiency, we're not moving the building into having an overheating risk. And we need to test that against future climates as well. And the version of PHPP you've got, which is version 10, is really good at allowing you to do that and to check it against um, a warming climate. And then passive, passive house is not just a, a space heating standard and an overheating risk standard, but it also looks at the, the, the total energy demand of your building. So it's not just about reducing um, the energy for heating, but also looking at all the other um, sources of energy, so um, hot water um, for uh, um, a, a non-domestic building like this, you're going to be looking at things like lighting, uh, you might be looking at, at um, kind of kit you've got in your building, um, and it's all about making sure you minimise that down as much as possible. Because while um, the uh, retrofit standards for uh, Passive House, so for Enerfit, uh, give you some a little bit of leeway in terms of um, heating demand. They don't give you much leeway in terms of the overall energy demand of the building. So you've got to make sure that you're looking at the whole building in a very efficient way. So just a little bit about form factor, because for this building, it's really, really important to, to understand about that. So as I said, it's this relationship between your, um, your heat loss surface areas and your internal floor area. And what, you're, what you want to have is, a is the smallest form factor you have. Um, so that means that you've got um, 
as much internal floor area as you have in relationship to your external um, wall area. And here are some typical buildings um, and the kind of form factors you've got with them. So we've got a bungalow here, which has got a form factor of about four, which means roughly that uh, you've got four times more heat loss surface area than you have internal floor area. And that's, that's difficult. Um, and if we look at and this example here, where we've got a three-story um, uh, mid-terrace townhouse, we've got a much lower form factor. It's down to 1.8. And that's because we've increased our, um, our internal floor, floor area because we've got three floors in here, effectively. Uh, we've got some party walls that are really helping us because they're not heat loss. Um, but we've also got a fairly reduced uh, ground floor and roof. Uh, because we've got a tall film, film building. And then this is a kind of typical um, semi-detached house, which has got a form factor of about 2.8. So roughly as a rule of thumb, we want to try and keep our form factor below about three. That would be really good. And the nearer we get it to two and to one, it means that you can be a bit more flexible on your U values. And that might be really helpful in your design. So I've had a look at the form factor of this building and it's got, a, well, it's a bungalow. So it's got a form factor of just about 4.1. So it's quite tricky. And what that means is that is we've got to work the U values um, really hard to meet the various standards that we want to get to. So just a little bit about um, the uh, kind of difference between the passive house kind of new build standard and the NFIT standard. You know, we, as Sarah said, you, we're looking at about 25 kilowatt hours maximum space heating demand for the space heating method. And it's much more variable if we use the component method, but there's a little bit of leeway on air tightness. For a new build, you'd be looking at about 0.6 air changes, which roughly, roughly translates to air permeability, which we use in UK building regs, but not quite. Um, whereas with uh, our NFIT, we, we can go slightly more, slightly less airtight at one, so it's still a very, very airtight building. But all of the other factors around overheating risk, um, primary energy, though not quite, there is a bit of give in the, um, the uh, component methods, that, uh, and I'll talk to you about that then. And all the kind of comfort standards we still have to achieve. So whilst we might have a bit more leeway on space heating, we've still got to make sure we're adhering to all the principles of Passive House, which is about airtight, it's about managing overheating risk and creating a really comfortable internal environment. Um, so uh, just to kind of um, this, so I've run, I've run the building in PHPP. I've done it both ways. I've done it using the space heating demand method and the component as it is. And obviously your building will change because uh, you've got the opportunities to change some of the, the design and to add more, more building onto it. So it, it will be different, but this is just kind of an example to show the, the two ways. Um, so here you can see, these are all the criteria that we need to meet to meet the standard. So here we've got our space heating demand. We, we've got to make sure it's under 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared. This is our overheating risk. And the, uh, this is not quite right. Um, no, this is, sorry, this is quite right. So we've got to make sure that 25% of, no more than, um, sorry, 10% of occupied hours are over 25 degrees C. Though these days we're, we are designing to much lower percentages than that to take into account future climate change. So we're looking at kind of one, two degrees as being really good practice. Um, we, here is our air tightness. Um, and we need to make sure that it's under one. And then we've got our primary energy um, uh, levels as well that we need to meet. So the, um, the software produces the standards for you once you choose which standard you want, and then you can constantly check back as you're designing your building to make sure you're meeting those standards. So this is, uh, this, is, this, is uh, this graph here is a kind of heat loss, um, uh, kind of heat gain um, balance that uh, you you start to um, create as you're, you're modeling your building in PHPP. So on here, we've got all the losses. So based on the strategy that I put in, the we've got the losses from the windows, the roof, the floor and the walls. We've got some um, thermal bridges and we've got some losses through our doors. And then this is heat loss through um, our air tightness. And then this is heat losses through our ventilation unit. And um, I would say with non-domestic buildings um, like this, how the building is going to be used and the, the amount of people we're going to have in our building is very much going to impact on our internal gains. 
So these are the gains that we've got through our building. These are our solar gains from the sun. These are our people and our, um, our kind of kit in the building. And then this is the residual amount is our space heating demand. So this is the 23 we saw on the slide before. Um, <clears throat> So how many people you have in the building is going to affect those internal gains. I assume there's going to be quite a few people, but maybe it, you might think differently. Um, and so when looking at the space heating demand method, I felt that the challenges were the uh, getting the U values down to the levels that you need to to get to that 25 kilowatt hours per meter squared. You're going to have to put a triple glazed um, unit in there. You're going to have to find space to put your MVHR unit in there as well. So you need to think about plant room and where that might be. Um, obviously, we need to keep our ventilation losses down by making our building very airtight. And again, Chris is going to talk about the detail of that. We talked about how the building is used. And also, we need to think about how our primary energy demand is going to be managed as well. And that might be thinking about hot water systems and making sure we've got as efficient as possible hot water systems in our building. Um, so these, I'll, I'll just go through these very quickly. These are the kind of, this is a kind of typical spec that I put together. Um, of the sort of U values you might need to meet a space heating demand in that kind of building with that quite poor form factor. So I'm looking at, um, at a floor of a U value of about 0.11, which is 300 mil of EPS insulation, so a completely new floor. Um, I split the insulation for the walls into two types. So one is external wall insulation, the other is internal because we've got to keep that facade. So where we've got external wall insulation, we can really kind of push it out a bit because we've got quite a lot of space around our building, so that's good. So I was looking about, you know, insulating the frame of the building, then 150 mil of external wall insulation. And then for, but for the internal, then we're looking, you're going to put less because you don't want to lose, lose um, area. So maybe 50 mil. And then the roof, and I assumed it was a warm roof. So we're going up into the vaulted roof. We're putting insulation between our rafters and then a, 150 mil over. So it's quite a lot of insulation. To think about how we're going to get in there. So this is the kind of U values that I was um, looking to achieve. To, looking to use to get to that space heating demand or using that method. Um, with the component method, we've got a lot more flexibility, as, um, as Sarah said. And I put together a specification that gave us a space heating demand of about 37. So that probably sits, feels about right, actually, sitting in the, um, in the range that Sarah was saying that you typically see for, for that kind of approach. Um, but we've still got to meet our overheating risks and we've still got to manage overheating. We've still got to make, we've still got to meet our air tightness. So that hasn't changed. Um, and we still need to meet our primary energy targets. But what is different with the component method is you, um, you get this kind of extra section between it, which looks at the, um, it looks at the, 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 the building and it, it the, and it looks at whether you're using internal or external wall insulation, and then it gives you target, um, target U values that you need to achieve. Um, and then it gives you um, a kind of target of the overall heat loss of what that overall heat loss of the building can be. And you just have to make sure that you meet those, you are within those maximum uh, U value um, or heat loss uh, targets. So for example, here, where we've got um, where we've got building envelope, oh, so we're above ground, um, we uh, we've got to have a, an overall target U value of 0.15, which kind of sits in the passive house uh, range, but we've got flexibility uh, within that, and it also allows us to have a slightly higher U value here if we use internal wall insulation because it knows that we can't get massive thicknesses, so it gives you a bit more flexibility there. Um, it sets the uh, the U values for the windows and and the and the doors down here. Um, so again, you can see there's a little bit of flexibility, not much. We're still looking at triple glazed, um, but there's a bit more flexibility there. And it sets us a minim minimum G value, so that's the amount of the, of the um, sorry a maximum G value. So it lets us um, it ensures that we're not getting too much solar gain. And also it sets the efficiency of our MVHR system, which within the passive house um, stable needs to be more than 75% efficient. So as long as we meet these elements and we meet the um, we, we meet our overheating risk and our air tightness and our primary energy, then we can comply with the, comp the component method. So it gives us a, a lot more flexibility. 
Um, so this is kind of how the building looks here. And we can see our, our heating demand is much more. Um, and we've got a bit more heat loss through our walls and our floor on our roof. Um, but our air tightness is the same and we still need our triple glazing and our MBHR. Okay, so these are the kinds of U values that I was looking at on this, this approach. So we've got slightly less uh, insulation in our floor, but we're still having to insulate our floor. Um, we've got slightly less external wall insulation and we might choose that we want to put more, but we could get away with a bit less and we've got a bit less internal wall insulation. Um, but we still got, uh, because we had space in the roof, we still got quite a reasonable amount of insulation sitting in our roof. Um, so we are, we, so it's really about um, the flexibility that you want on the approach you want to take. Um, so I suppose what I would, what I would be saying is you can use either. Um, space heating demand is definitely more challenging, um, but it's more energy efficient. So it's about deciding which is the approach you want to take. And maybe one way is to look at both and compare them and see, um, see, see what the benefits are for, 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 for using both, both approaches. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and let Chris talk to you about the, uh, the detail of using timber frame for retrofit and how you achieve all those, those tricky air tightness details. Right, let me just get myself started just a second. Yeah. Right, can you see that? Yes. Right, okay. Um, so my name is Chris Morgan. I'm an architect um, in Glasgow, John Gilbert Architects. Um, I was a certified passive house designer, but I realised recently that <laughs> my certification has lapsed. So I'm no longer described as a certified passive house designer. I'm described as an experienced passive house designer, which kind of sounds better, but just means I haven't updated my thingy. Um, however, I have done quite a few, so hopefully this is useful. Um, okay, so think. I'm going to talk about three three projects. Um, so I was asked to give a case study um, of, a, of an inner fit project, which we did, but unfortunately wasn't built. So I will do that last. There's another project, which I think will be quite useful to talk about. It's not passive house, but it's timber frame and it's probably relevant. And then I thought I would do some sketches of this building just to show you the way I would think about it. Um, and, and, and if that helps you, great, you know. Um, so things that occur to me, I mean, I'm looking at that and thinking, well, I don't know what the section is, but I can guess, you know. So is is the insulation in the ceiling probably not it's probably in the roof so we've got some space up there um but then i'm looking at that form and thinking that it's, it's not ideal form factor rachel's already done that so she stole my thunder but the point is um if we could do something about that form factor that would be a good thing um if you were if you're making changes and i didn't i wasn't aware that you were able to do that so i think um, i would take the opportunity to do that if you can um, form factor is not ideal. Um, the thing about a form factor is that if you have a good one, it makes everything else cheaper and easier. And one of the problems we have all the time is cost. So if it's very expensive, um, you know, pe people aren't happy. So, but, but a good form factor makes everything easier. So it's well worth trying to do. Um, exposure doesn't sound, doesn't look too bad. The function, the thing that I'm noticing here, and I've done quite a lot of sports centers in my life, uh, there is a lot of hot water there. There's a lot, lot of hot water, so there's a lot of heating of hot water uh, instantly, potentially, because it'll be sitting empty for ages and then suddenly there'll be 20 people needing a shower. So that's a big deal in my mind. Um, and the other thing about all that hot water is that there'll be an awful lot of vapour, moisture. So um, I, I look at that as a fairly extreme moisture risk, actually. So when later on I'm talking about vapour control, it's not an idle chat, it's, it's a serious thing. Um, so I'm looking at that, there's, there's several rooms there with the very, very high moisture loads, which are temporary and then will disappear again. So we need to think about that. It's not just energy. Uh, moisture risk, yes, that's the thing. Solar gain, doesn't look like there's much solar gain. So we're not gonna get much help from the sun. So we're gonna have to do it all ourselves. Um, and that's a problem in retrofit. You've, you inevitably end up with the, the one building that doesn't face south and has small windows. And then, you know, it's just annoying. But the point is we're trying to get in passive house, we're trying to get a third of all the heat from the sun. <laughs> Um, but if you can't, then you can't. So then you just have to work harder. Um, and this looks to me like you'll have to work harder. And then NFIT or ACB, I wasn't sure what the story with that was. So, um, but ACB is easier basically. Um, uh, but NFIT is, is worth doing. Um, these are my thoughts. So I haven't talked about, I haven't talked about the roof or the floors at all. I wasn't quite sure. 
Um, but these are the walls. So this is what I think the wall is based on Rachel's model. And um, but there's no details that I could see. So I think you have a timber frame with timber cladding on the outside. That's at the top there. That stripey stuff is timber cladding. And then on the inside, we have plasterboard. That's the only information I have. We, we also know, or Rachel has told us, that there's some PIR boards in, in the timber frame. Um, so that's my sort of interpretation of what that means uh, in, in, in wall section. Is there enough insulation? No, because look at the U value. So we know that. Um, even though PIR has a fabulously low lambda value, which is the sort of you know resistivity of heat value, which I would I would treat very cautiously as a thing, um, if I were you. Um, so is there enough insulation? No, there isn't because we're not meeting the U values that we need. Uh, is there thermal bridging? Definitely, because we're not insulating around those timber frames. So we've got to do something about that, um, probably. Uh, is there air leakage? Guaranteed, lots of air leakage. There's nothing stopping the air going in and out. Um, and it's only if you can promise me that that PIR is being cut perfectly and will remain perfectly tight to that timber frame for the next 50 years that I would suggest we've got any hope of achieving any um, air tightness. So th there's nothing in there creating air tightness, uh, really. So I would imagine we've got pretty poor um, air tightness in that building and we've got thermal bypass. Now, as I'm trying to remember if thermal bypass has been discussed, but the simple way I describe it is that air tightness is the air that goes from inside to out or from outside to in. It basically goes from all the way through the wall and out to the other side or into the other side. The thing about thermal bypass is that it goes in and doesn't necessarily come out. So it causes mischief in the building fabric, um, but it doesn't necessarily go all the way through. And again, there'll be absolutely masses of thermal bypass in that construction. There'll be lots of air floating around inside that construction causing trouble. So yes, we have thermal bypass. Do we have, is it vapor permeable? Is it safe for moisture? Uh, sort of, but only because it's so drafty. I imagine that moisture isn't a problem in that building because it's so drafty, it'll be fine. But that PIR is a disaster for, for moisture um, and you really want rid of it if you possibly can. Um, is it robust, long lasting? It's probably all right because it's so drafty. So it probably lasts for ages actually. It's just that it'll last for ages with a very, very high energy input. So it's not, it, basically it's not gonna help you. Um, so what do we need to do? So one of the options is um, we can insulate on the inside. Uh, according, this is me interpreting Rachel's PHPP, so I, I might be slightly wrong here, but one of the options was 50 mil of um, what looks like rock wall on the inside, probably replacement in the rock wall on the in, on, in between the joists. That's a good move, I would say. Um, if you if you get into this, you'll hear about lambda values. So PIR is better than rock wall for insulation, right? That's what people will tell you because it's got a lower number. But it's basically not true <laughs> because what you really want in a timber frame is something squishy that sticks tight to the timber frame. So I would, I mean, I never ever use rigid insulation in a timber frame. So if you can learn anything useful for me at all, I would say never use rigid stuff in a timber frame. It doesn't last. And even if it's got a really, really cool lambda figure, uh, the air passing through it because it wasn't cut properly is gonna outweigh that. So um, what Rachel's done there with mineral wool or, or, or maybe it's a sort of natural wool is, is definitely preferable. Um, so is there enough insulation? Well, we haven't got, we've got a sort of quite good U value. I mean, Rachel was describing it um, in the round, but to me, that's probably not enough. To, um, we haven't got quite enough to break that thermal bridge in my, simplistic head, you need 100 mil of insulation to break a thermal bridge. So um, 50 mil to me is probably not enough, but there are issues about having more or less. So I'm just saying the things that occur to me. Um, is there enough insulation? Possibly not. Is the thermal bridging a bit still because we've only got 50 mil breaking that thermal bridge of the timber studs? Air leakage, well, air leakage, what I've done, and I hope you can see it, is I've introduced a little dashed line, which is a lot easier to draw than it is to build. But I've introduced a dashed line outside the timber frame and inside the timber frame. And that's me saying, I want to prevent air from getting into the insulation on the outside, and I want to prevent it getting in from the inside. So if you do that and you seal it all and you make all your junctions lovely, then you should be fine. Um, if not, then you've got an issue with air leakage still, even though the rock wall will help. Have you got thermal bypass? Not in my detail, assuming that you detail it properly. Is it vapor permeable? Well, sort of rock wool is vapor permeable, but it's got rubbish capillary action, so it's not perfect, but it's a much better solution. And is that robust? Um, yeah, I'd say so. One of the things you can see is I always draw sockets. Can you see that? That's meant to be a socket on the, the lower bit, the bottom bit. 
Um, and if you go back one, what you can, one of the things that I'll always draw on other people's drawings is that's a socket being put into that wall, breaking everything that was meant to be there. So, um, you know, think about the electrical socket. So I've said, well, that's, that's a crap detail. So um, I've introduced a, a, a service void on the inside so that you can move the electrics around to your heart's content in the future without damaging the, the vapor control there. So uh, that's me doing what I would hope is sort of reasonably good practice there, but you know, whatever you think is best. Um, or you can put the insulation on the outside, same set of thoughts really. These, this U value looks a bit better to me, 0.145. In my head, passive house needs to be under 0 0.15, 0 0.15, but yeah, component methods and all sorts of funny things happen. But if you just sort of have that in your head as that's the number I sort of should have, if you don't get it, that's fine as long as you've got a rationale for why not. Um, is there enough insulation? Yeah, pretty much. Is there thermal bridging? No, there's a hundred mil of rock wall either side of the, on one side of that timber frame. So I think you've got no thermal bridging there. Is there a leakage? Not if you put my wee dash lines in. Chris's dash lines, both sides, and everyone's a winner. Um, but that means you've got to take the cladding off, you know. But so in this in this option, the advantage is you don't have to move the insides, right? You can put all the insulation on the outside, tim the take, take the timber cladding off, do everything on the outside. There's no disruption to the inside. But I've drawn it that there is disruption to the inside because I'm wanting you to put a vapor control layer on the inside. And, and then I'm putting a service void, you know, and new plasterboard. So it's a pain in the neck for everybody, but that's the way to get a better detail. And you might decide not to do that. So no air leakage if you use my detail. Thermal bypass, probably not, as long as it's done properly. Vapor permeable, yeah, it's fine. Robust, yeah, I'd say so, pretty much. That should be okay. Um, so that's just me thinking about the basics and it's easier to draw it and talk about it than it is to show details because details tend to get a bit complicated. This was a similar-ish thing we did right out on the West Coast. This is in Tyree, so it is windy. Air tightness is a thing. Um, oh, look, I'm just looking at the time. I've got, I've only got about five minutes, haven't I? So I'll go very quickly through this. All right, uh, um, Chris, Chris, we're not, we don't have any question and answers because we can't get the function to work. So you've got until... Let's <laughs> go on for hours then. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. How long have you got? Um, this is the same sort of construction, believe it or not, as your um, as your uh, pavilion. The difference is that instead of there being timber cladding on the outside of the timber frame, there's a block wall, basically. This is a Scottish thing. They do a timber frame, exactly the same, but then instead of leaving timber, nice, sensible timber cladding, they cover it in just appalling concrete and render. So it's a special Scottish tradition. Um, which is not nice. Um, but this is basically the same construction, except you've got block on the outside. Um, so these are buildings that we were asked to look at. What can we do with them? Because they're quite new, they're quite modern. They're built in the, in the noughties, um, but they're rubbish and everybody's paying an absolute fortune for them. That, that the people in that house there are paying 3000 pounds a year for heating in a modern house, which is energy efficient and has a really good sat rating. And nobody wants to pay to upgrade it because it's a brand, it's not brand new, but it's like 15, 20 year building. And the people in the houses are going, well, 3,000 pounds, you tell me how energy efficient it is. It's a lot of nonsense. So, you know, so one of the things is, you know, what can you actually do? And the reason we did this is because I'm absolutely certain that timber frame buildings are the challenge for retrofit, actually. Everybody says masonry buildings are hard to treat. They're pretty easy compared to timber frame in my view. So anyway, we did lots of work looking at all the issues. What were the air tightness? So this is just looking around the houses. Um, we did a quite a reasonably detailed sort of condition survey where we could see all sorts of entertaining pop-ups that had been done by the contractors. So lots of things missing, lots of things that shouldn't be the way they are, you know, um, all good construction stuff. Um, that was the only detail that was given, so it was hard to work out exactly what was going on, but we worked off that as far as we could. Um, we did quite a lot of WIFI analysis for various reasons. I don't know if anybody's come across WIFI, but it's an interesting thing because you're looking at long-term moisture and heat. So that's an interesting thing to do. Um, this was the existing building. So it's the same thing as the pavilion, except that you've got concrete blocks on the outside. You've got a timber frame. The difference is we've got a board on the outside. So you can see from the inside, a plasterboard with socket, rock wall in between the timber frame and then a, a sort of plywood board and then and then concrete so we were looking at what could you do with it um you could put the insulation on the outside i'll go quickly through this um so exactly the same as i discussed earlier so we're putting in this case wood fiber on the outside but we're also taking off the outer sheathing so we can tart up the the, the rock wall inside the timber frame because inevitably that's started to fall apart so that's improved insulation within the frame and external insulation added and then timber cladding 
um, on the outside because it's nicer than concrete in my view. Um, I won't go through that. And then the alternative, as discussed earlier, is you can put the insulation on the inside. And again, here, 100 mil on the inside with an improved bit of insulation in between the joist and then a service void. Hopefully that's all relatively clear. And this is recorded, isn't it? So if I go quickly, you can at least go back to it. Um, this is the option, the cheaper option, where we don't take the, um, we, we, we don't strip off the, the timber frame and look at what's going on on the inside. Um, we just sort of add new stuff and, and hope for the best. So I wasn't very keen on that, but it was it was a cheaper option. Um, it's advantages and disadvantages. Then we, you know, we, you obviously have to do all the other details. It's not just a wall detail. Um, last one the, was the cross walls project, which is the one I was actually meant to be asking, what I meant to be talking about. Uh, the sad thing about this is that we did absolutely masses of work and it didn't happen in the end. The, we got all the money, we got the tenders back and the, there were procedural issues with the tenders. And as a result of that, there was a risk of legal challenge from other tenders and therefore the whole thing didn't happen. So two million pounds worth of money from London didn't go into the poorest part of Paisley because of procedural issues which does my head in, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, it's incredibly disappointing. The other thing that's worth knowing is that we didn't in the end decide to do the, the cassettes over the roof because of, of just because of so many issues and pro practical problems. So in reality, we're doing wall panels. Uh, well, the, the final result was wall panels with insulation across the loft, which was far, far simpler for everybody basically and cheaper. Uh, so very quickly, these are the sort of houses that we were dealing with. They were spread all over Paisley which meant that every project was an individual project, which made it more expensive because we have neighbours every time and scaffolding every time and a crane every time, uh, which made it much more expensive. So we ended up, it was actually the, 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 the successful tender that didn't go ahead was 54 grand a house. Um, and we're tending to work to 25, 30, 35 usually. So that's quite a bit more. Um, Benefit and niche compliance, we've partnered with lots of people, including Pastivars Trust. Um, uh, these are some of the things we did. So we, there's quite a lot of assessment, a lot of thermal bridging calculations, a lot of detail in the how you did get the air tightness, because in that case, particularly, it was a pain in the neck getting air tightness at the, at the roof. So we did lots of extra details and quite a lot of work with people to understand contractors and, and, and tenants and so on. Uh, these are the sorts of things we were looking at. These are the issues we were trying to establish up front so that we knew what the problems were and where to look for them. Uh, and we divided them all into archetypes, which is a, a theme that you'll probably hear about. Archetypes is everybody's favorite word at the moment. Um, that's what we were doing. Solar PV, uh, PVs, insulated roof, new gap down pipes, new windows, new um, cassettes stuck on the outside and then insulation in the floor which was complicated mvhr air tightness all of the things that you've heard about but done in a sort of bring it off-site way you know um which i'm not a huge fan of actually but people love that stuff they love it they like putting money into it i think it's easy just to get a bunch of builders and just do it on the, on the building site to be honest but anyway um maintain the architectural features that was crucial we weren't trying to change the look of the building um, how we specified it, how we detailed it, how we sequenced it, because that was quite complicated, and quite a lot of workshop with contractors or, or tendering contractors. Uh, lots of thermal bridging counts to make sure we were okay with our PHPP. Um, uh, quite a lot of air tightness stuff, which was quite complicated in this case, because it's a very, very strange form of construction. Um, so the air tightness was genuinely complicated here. Um, I don't think it will be as complicated for you in the pavilion. Um, and yeah, we started doing these sort of details because we were finding we couldn't work it out ourselves. So we thought if we can't work it out with no hope of telling a contractor. So we did our own drawings of what would actually happen and what you needed to do. And that that helped convince everybody it was feasible. Um, these were the PHPPs for the different types of house. And this was just a detail. So what you can see, um, can I point to things? I can't point to things. Um, if you look at the wall, what you can see is that big yellow thing. That is a 50 mil slab of rock wall, which is 30 years old and does not really look like that anymore, to be honest. Um, but what we did was so there's um, so that you can see, hopefully, on the right hand side of that wall, a plywood layer, that bit of yellow insulation and then a bit of plasterboard on the inside. That's the existing wall. Um, and then we added this cassette on the outside. So that's 200 mil of rock wall um, in a sort of posh cassette that was craned in. And for that, we obviously need extra foundations to support it and so on and so forth. So um, that is it, just to give you a feel of the detail. Um, and, and that's me. Uh, so hang on, escape. Um, stop sharing. I hope that wasn't too fast, but hopefully you can, if it is recorded, you can stop and look at the details and things like that.
Thanks, Chris. There's yeah, incredible details, and and that's that's why we bring the challenge together. Exactly those details and the experience you all have, you know, in in, in this really challenging um, um, new way of world building, I suppose. But it's uh, um, because we haven't got question any any questions and answers. Is there any final words you'd like? to share before we I show the final few slides about how to get involved. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so so I yeah to say it's so great to see students engaging with retrofit projects because it feels like all that's what all the architecture schools need to be working on because adaptive reuse of buildings is is clearly the future when we've got so many buildings that need to be upgraded before we get to 2045 or 2050 so really really positive to see this competition being on retrofit this year can i just add something to that actually sorry Tatha. i think it's worth doing i really do if i was a student now i'd, I'd be looking at this thinking um I, I have come across a lot of conversation of people who said you can't you can't refurbish buildings just have to lock it down and start again but it's really expensive it, it's simply not true you know it's simply not true and i think if i was a student and i was looking to sort of make a bit of a mark for myself i'd be thinking i want to know about retrofit i want to know the detail i want to know the nuance of it because i want to be able to say to people you can save that building you can work on this you can make it even better we're doing retrofits which are more energy efficient than new builds now and i mean you know that's quite satisfying because it's you know a quarter of the price so, you know, being able to know that and being able to tell clients that is really good. You know, it's a good thing. And, you know, you're having to think about marketing yourselves. I, I would have that skill if I was you. I think it's a good skill to have. But no, I'm brilliant. I mean, I live in the 1840s. I just passed in my own retrofit. So, yeah, I came to it a few years ago. Um, but yes, so while some of our students from last year have gone on to interview the companies that they've chosen to work for as opposed to the other way around. So, yeah, you're absolutely correct. It is, it is so, um, you know, at, at where we need to be. And yeah, you're going to be at the cutting edge. And and you have all your fantastic professionals, which you can come and chase down and, uh, you know, glean that knowledge and information for and maybe come and work with in the future. But, um, yeah, so I'll just share my screen again. And say a huge thank you to our presenters tonight, Sarah Lewis from the Passive House Trust, Rachel Mitchell from Green Box Associates, Chris Morgan from John Gilbert Architects. And this is the pavilion, pavilion they've been talking about. And so, yes, it's so we've got Google Street View, which shows it you can go all the way around it and Google Earth. You can see where it sits. Um, just to note, there is a stream that runs to the almost south side of the, the building. It's maybe a ditch, maybe a stream. And when you think it's called Wide Marsh, why is it called Wide Marsh? That could cause some interesting um, problems. And as you say, yeah, Britain from above, it, uh, we've got photographs going back to 1934, I think. Um, so next week, Come and join us where we will have three speakers from um, the AECB to talk about the AECB standard. Um, following that, the so following week on the 6th of December, retrofit detailing for a timber frame. So we will be talking about um, MVHR, we'll be talking about the air tightness and we'll be talking about engineering and um, um, the foundations. Um, following that, there will be we will have a session on team formation, two sessions to get you from individuals into teams. Um, and once we're into Teams, you have this fabulous offer of three integrated softwares. So Design PH and PHPP. So you'll end up talking to Rachel and Sarah in um, January. Um, Triple SketchUp because SketchUp um, works in Design PH. And so Dave Edwards will come and talk to you about that. And then the AECB Carbon Calculator and Tim Martell, who wrote it, and you'll probably go for the PH ribbon version, will come and talk to you about that. So you're going to get trained on software too. And where do you find all this information? It's on the challenge pages of the Timber Development UK website. So Timber Development UK is the merger of TRADA, which is the Timber Research Centres and Development Association and the Timber Trade Federation. A brand new website, go to timberdevelopment.uk, go onto the education page, click on challenges, and that's where you'll find all the information on how to get involved. All these, um, 
videos and webinars are recorded and put on our YouTube challenge. So come and join in. See you next.